right, let's talk about heat. So when we think about heat, we think about, okay, well, what does the thermometer say? How hot it is? So we're thinking about the temperature, but what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So basically what's happening is when you have particles, when they're cold, they move slower. When they're hot, they move faster. And so when you have a thermometer, right? So let's say I have some sort of like device that measures temperature. All right, so I have particles. My particles are going to be hitting whatever like the bulb of that thermometer is. And so if my particles have less kinetic energy, they're going to hit the bulb of the thermometer less frequently. If my particles have more kinetic energy, they're going to hit the bulb of the thermometer more frequently. And so we get that temperature based on the frequency that everything's hitting the bulb of the thermometer. When we talk about heat, heat is actually just a measure of the total energy. Okay, so if we think about this concept, we've got a balloon, it has helium gas. It's cooled from 25 degrees Celsius to negative 25 degrees Celsius. So what happens to the you know, kinetic energy of this gas as we cool it down? Well, the kinetic energy goes down. And what happens to the motion of the helium atoms? They get slower. we go. Okay, so the motion of our helium atoms is going to get slower. All right, now we can start to measure things by looking at what's called the specific heat. Okay, so we get the specific heat of a substance or the specific heat capacity. Basically, if I have one gram of a substance, how much heat energy does it take to take that one gram and raise it by one degree Celsius. So everything has its own unique specific heat capacity. So specific heat capacity is something that we call an intensive property because it does not depend on how much of the sample I have. It's always going to have this exact same heat capacity. So it's actually a way that we can use to identify an unknown substance. We can measure its heat capacity and compare that to a list of known data. Now water, as you can see on this table here, has a very high specific heat capacity. 4.184 joules are required to raise one gram of water Water by one degree Celsius. This is why water takes a long time to heat up and cool down. Um, if you have a pool that you have access to, when the weather starts to warm up, the pool doesn't immediately get hot. It takes quite a while uh, of the weather being warmer before the pool actually starts heating up. It stays cool for quite a long time. It's also why our bodies don't immediately freeze or evaporate when a temperature changes as we go from indoor to outdoor because water has that high specific heat capacity. Some substances have a very low specific heat capacity. Other substances have a much higher specific heat capacity. Okay, and so this equation here, I can rewrite it looking like this. We do mc delta t equals q. So m is mass, c is the specific heat, delta t is the change in temperature, and then q is the variable that we use for heat. Okay. So let's do a couple of examples. So I have the specific heat, specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So I want to calculate the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 85.9 grams of water by seven degrees Celsius. Okay, so according to my problem here, I have some information. Okay, I have a mass. Oh. I accidentally hit the yellow. That makes it very hard to see. Let's try that again. All right, I have the mass, and that is the 85.9 grams. I have the specific heat capacity, which is the 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then I want to raise the water by seven degrees. So that is my change in temperature. So my delta T 
is 7 degrees Celsius. And so again, my formula is MC delta T okay, equals that heat. So now it's just a matter of plugging it all in. So Q is equal to 85, oops, 85.9. Times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times 7 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then my units, grams and grams cancel out. Degree Celsius, degree Celsius cancel out. And so I'm left in terms of joules. And so heat, we can use joules. All right. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get 2.516 times 10 to the third joules. Now my significant figures here, seven degrees Celsius. I only have one sig fig. Whoever did that should have used another sig fig. So we're gonna have to round this to one sig fig. So there's a five next to that two. So we're gonna round this to three times 10 to the third joules. It's actually a pretty decent amount of rounding there because it was 2.5 and we had to round it up to three. So Sig figs, super important. All right, let's try another one. Now in this one, we're gonna have to do a calculation before we can do our final calculation. So now I have 75 grams of water, but I want to increase the temperature from one temperature to another. So we're gonna have to calculate our delta T. So our mass is our 75. Okay, specific heat capacity is still the 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius because we're still dealing with water. And now our delta T. So to get our delta T, we're gonna take the final minus the initial. So the final temperature we want to get to is the 36.1 and the initial temperature is the 22.3. So it's gonna be temperature final minus temperature initial. All right, so we're going to take our 36.1 minus our 22.3, and we end up with a delta T of 13.8. That's better. We get a few more sig figs this time. All right, now we can plug it in. Okay, so again, it's the MC delta T. So we have our 75 grams are 4.184 and then our 13.8 okay and so this time we're going to get 4.33 times 10 the second joules okay so that is our change in or our heat that requires to get that change in temperature for our 75 grams of water. All right, now, when we think about our food, okay, when we think about energy and food, we use calories or sometimes kilocalories. So like the calorie that we measure in is the same thing as for food, is the same thing as saying a kilocalorie. So what we use for food is we use what's called a calorimeter. For food, we typically use something called a bomb calorimeter, where what's happening is we take a piece of the food that we want to figure out the caloric value of, and we put it in this bomb calorimeter and we combust it. And that combustion gives off an amount of heat. That heat is then transferred to a water bath that is around the combustion chamber. And there's a thermometer there that registers the change in temperature. And so by knowing the specific heat capacity of water, the change in temperature of the water and the mass of water that's in our chamber, we're able to then go, okay, this is the amount of energy that the water changed by, and it's equal to the amount of energy given off by the food because we've got our conservation laws. So what is output by something would be the same thing that's taken up by another. So whatever is given off by the food in the bomb calorimeter is what is absorbed by the water because everything's insulated. So the water's not going to be increasing in temperature from the outside environment. It's only going to be increasing in temperature from what happens in the combustion chamber of the bomb calorimeter. And so we're able to, from that principle, 
figure out that, okay, the water absorbed this much energy, therefore there's, there is that much energy in the sample of food, okay? So we have some really rounded off values here, all right? One sig fig for our kilocalories per joule, per, per gram here. Uh, so a little bit rounded off. And, you know, typically speaking, when we look at consumer products, if you pick up any food package that you have in your house and you look at the calories, it's not going to be listed to a great number of significant figures. Everything's rounded off for a general consumer. And so the column that we're interested in here is this one right here. This is telling me the number of calories per gram of that particular food type. So carbs, fats, and proteins have different amounts of calories per gram. And so using these average rounded off numbers, we can do some just basic calculations here. So let's say you go to a party. Let's say it's a kid's birthday party. And so you're being served pizza, ice cream, and soda. Not very healthy, but hey, it's standard party fare. Um, so let's say you have one slice of pizza, okay? How many calories would you gain from eating that one slice of pizza? So what we have to do is we had those average values on the previous slide. And so what I can do for my pizza is I'm going to look here at my pizza. And so my pizza, I've got the number of grams of protein, fat, and carbs. And so I can calculate the calories from that piece of pizza. So my pizza, I'm going to do uh, my protein. So I have 13 grams of protein times 4 kilocalories per gram plus 10 grams of fat times 9 kilocalories per gram and then my carbs 29 grams of carbs times 4 kilocalories per gram and again that is the calorie that we're thinking of okay all right, it's just um, different circles. Like some nutrition circles use calorie. Um, a lot of places have started to use kilocalorie, but our consumer products still just say calorie, at least in this country. In other countries, I believe they um, mention kilocalories, um, which is a little bit more accurate because you don't have to differentiate between the different types of calorie. It's just easy to put it in kilocalories. Okay, so we can calculate all of this and we end up getting are you get 258 calories okay all right now what happens if we have the pizza the soda and the ice cream so i'm just going to give you the values for the soda and the ice cream and you can practice the calculation on your own to see if you get the same numbers i do and so for the soda which is also cola depending on where you're at. Um, that came out to be 204 calories. And the ice cream came out to be 460. Okay, and so if I want to know how much all three of those, the pizza, the soda, and the ice cream were, then I'm going to add them all up. So I'm going to take my 258 calories calories plus my 204 plus my 460 and I'm going to get 922 calories and that was just one slice of pizza it's a lot of calories okay now let's say that this is a pool party all right you eat that pizza, you eat that ice cream, you drink that soda. Now you're thinking about, well, maybe I should go in the pool and swim some laps and figure out, well, how many laps, how long do I need to swim laps in order to burn off all of these calories from this pizza or use up the energy I got from the pizza? Okay, so here's some, again, rounded off values. Here's some average values um given four different activities for an average sized adult human so 
if we're just looking at the pizza, not that whole meal, so we're going to discount the ice cream and the cola, just the pizza, how long do we need to swim to use up that energy that we got from the slice of pizza? Now, these values are given in kilocalorie per hour. Um, when we do the calculation, we're also going to go one step further and convert it off to minutes because it becomes a fraction of an hour. Um, so putting it to minutes, I think, will help. All right. So... We want swimming right here. Okay. So that pizza, okay, was 258 calories or kilocalories. So we take 258 kilocalories times one hour for 500 kilocalories. And then we have 60 minutes in one hour, okay? And so this comes out to 30.96 minutes, okay? Now our value here, that energy, 500. Are there any decimal points there? No, so we only have one so big. So we can round this to 30 minutes that 30.96 would round to 31 minutes but again we only get one sig fig so we got to keep that to just 30 minutes so basically you're gonna have to swim for about a half hour just a little bit over a half hour um, on average to burn off the calories from that one slice of pizza that's not even counting the soda and the ice cream okay and then if we look at a value here okay you can see I've got calories from fat, calories in general. And so do the calories from the fat make sense? So this is saying there's 35 calories from fat. Well, when I look at this label, I can find the different values that let me know how many grams of things were in there. So grams of fat right here, four grams, okay? So let's see here, if I have four grams of fat, and we know that on average, there's about nine calories per gram of fat, I can do, oh, forgot to switch off the yellow, give me just a moment. Okay, we can do four grams times our nine calories per gram, and we're gonna get 36. This is reported at 35. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense because, again, these are all rounded values. So they may be calculating with a better number than nine, or maybe that grams of fat was rounded off. So yeah, 35 to 36, that absolutely makes sense within the confines of the extreme amount of rounding that there is very obviously going on here. So did the calories make sense? Yes. Okay. And then just... One final little aside is just on hydrocarbons. Again, hydrocarbons are just hydrogen and carbon, and we have a whole bunch of them. You don't need to memorize these. This is just, you know, point of information. A lot of the fuels that we use are various different hydrocarbons. So like methane is that first one, just CH4. Propane, um, we go camping, we have a camping trailer, and so we have a propane tank that we burn. Uh, Actually, we have a few propane tanks. There's one attached to the trailer, and then we have uh, a portable like fire pit thing that has a portable propane tank. We have a fire pit on our patio in our backyard that's also powered by propane. So we utilize a lot of hydrocarbons in our lives as fuel um, for energy for various different things.